Hi there everybody and welcome back to my channel, this time for a look at the giant ionic lattice crystal structure. At GCSE you encounter the giant ionic lattice and you do all the groundwork which is still very very true at A level. All of that concept of the metal transferring its outer electrons to the non-metal and creating ions is exactly what we still talk about. But what changes a little bit at A level is perhaps the definition that you have to use in the exam and also the dot and cross diagrams become a little bit more complicated. So in this tutorial what I'm going to take a look at for you is all the upgrading that you do from GCSE to A level for the giant ionic lattice structure and by the end of it you should have more confidence when it comes to those more complicated dot and cross diagrams. So I don't want to unpick at all any of the stuff you've done before at GCSE. We've still got our metals, we've still got our non-metals, we've still got the transfer of the outer electrons from the metals to the non-metals to create the giant ionic lattice. I just want to make sure that we're focusing on the right thing when we're defining a giant ionic lattice in the exam. So when we have a giant ionic lattice at A level, we make the clear definition that this is the electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions with the metals being our cations, so they lose electrons and become positively charged, and the non-metals being our anions, so they accept electrons and they become negatively charged. And what we end up with is a regular and repeating pattern like this of the oppositely charged ions in a giant lattice structure. Now, something we're expected to do in A-level examinations, much like GCSEs, is draw a dot and cross diagram, which represents the structure of our giant ionic lattice. Now, we're not gonna draw it quite like this though, because we would be there for a very long time, especially if we consider that if we look inside the lattice framework and we find any one ion, it's surrounded by six other oppositely charged ions. For example, if I was a sodium plus ion, I should expect that in six different directions around me, I should find six Cl minus ions. That would be a very big dot and cross diagram. So the dot and cross diagram just represents the simplest ratio between the ions in the giant ionic lattice structure, much like the formula does. So for example, if this was an NaCl dot and cross diagram, I would just need to show one Na plus and one Cl minus. But at A level, your dot and cross diagrams can get a little bit more complicated. So let's review some of the tips we need to know and the extension we can make to these in order to make us best prepared for the exam. So when it comes to the dot and cross diagrams, we want a set procedure that we can follow to make sure we have almost like a checklist in the exam of steps we can take to make sure that we don't get caught out by any of the more complicated examples at A level. The reason we might need this at A level is because those straightforward GCSE scenarios of NaCl and KBr are going to be met by other examples like Na2O and even calcium nitride, which is going to be Ca3N2. So we need a set of procedures in place that can help us out in the exam and it then means we have a flow each time we do one of these questions. Very often as well in the A-level examinations, you're not obviously told the ions, so you may need to figure them out for yourselves. Thankfully, there's a rule we can follow with the metals for this that makes it just that little bit more straightforward. So, first off, you know that your ionic dot and cross diagram is going to have two clear components, the cation and the anion. So the first thing you need to do is put two sets of square brackets. You're going to put your cation inside one of the sets of square brackets and you're going to put your anion in the other. Now you'll notice here I am only telling you to do two sets of square brackets. Even if you have multiple of individual ions in the formula, we're only going to use one set of square brackets for the cation and the anion separately. And the reason for this is because to save us time in the exam, we're going to use some large numbers in front of the square brackets where required to save us some time and stop us making mistakes by writing out multiple of the same kind of thing. It's accepted by most exam boards and I know for certain it's accepted by the OCRA specification, which I currently teach. So, now I've got my set of square brackets, let's turn our attention to the metal. The metal will always have a positive ionic charge that matches its group number. So for example, sodium, potassium, lithium, they're in group one. So I know they're going to be one plus and I don't need to show any of their outer electrons because they've already transferred them over. Magnesium, calcium, barium, I know that they're going to be in group two. So they're going to be two plus. That saves me some time. 
I also then can use the charge of the metal to help determine perhaps the unknown charge of the non-metal. Remember that all the pluses should equal all the minuses and the formula is patterned as such to make sure that we don't have any incorrect charges introduced. So if I'm given a formula like Na2O, sodium oxide in the exam, because I know that the sodium is in group one and it has to be one plus, and there are two of them in that formula, I can determine that each oxygen is going to be two minus. And I can do this for all of the dot and cross diagrams. Get some practice with the ones you can see on screen. Then I turn my attention to my non-metal. Now with my non-metal, what I want to make sure I do is inside the square brackets, I want to already put the pre-existing number of electrons that matches the group number of that particular non-metal. For example, if I was looking at the sodium oxide example, I know that oxygen is in group six. So I'm gonna put either six dots or six crosses inside the square brackets to begin with. I then add however many of the other symbol, so dots instead of crosses or crosses instead of dots, that is necessary to take that inside number, so inside the square brackets, up to eight. So for instance, if I was looking at the sodium oxide example, I would add in two more electrons to take me from six to eight. Just make sure you use the other symbol. It doesn't matter exactly how you position them around each other inside the square brackets, although I do recommend that you put them in the clock positions of 12, three, six, and nine, because it's where the examiner is expecting to be looking. So what next? It's charges outside the square brackets. Now we're on the non-metal, we wanna make sure that the charge that goes outside the square brackets for the non-metal matches the number of electrons you had to introduce to take it up to the eight. So for example, for the oxygen, I had to add in two more of the other kind of symbol, two more electrons, so it's two minus. If I was looking at calcium nitride, I'm gonna have two of the nitride ion, each nitride ion is gonna be three minus, because inside the square brackets, I have a nitrogen, which is in group five, so five existing electrons of a dot kind or a cross kind, for instance, and it takes three more to get it up to the eight. So the charge outside the square brackets there would be three minus, and that rule always works. It's great. The final thing we need to do is make sure that outside the square brackets, at the front of them, away from the charge, We've got an extra multiplier, a big number, a coefficient there, which allows us to balance the total charge. So in the sodium oxide example, I put a big two in front of the sodium ion square brackets to indicate that I mean multiple of those square brackets. It stops me having to write out two sets of them and potentially make a mistake in the exam. If I was looking at the calcium nitride example, then I'd put a big three in front of the calcium ion and big two in front of the nitrogen ion, the nitride. And that means I match the formula and save a lot of time, particularly in that example. I really hope you found this video tutorial helpful. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you could give it a like before you go and consider subscribing to stay updated. Until next time though, happy revising.